As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, thank you, Mary, for that reading. Let me have my welcome to Ewan's. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Pete, one of the leaders here at Trinity. It's lovely to see you, particularly if you're here for the first time. We're really pleased that you are with us this morning. It'd be a great hope, help to all of you if you could keep open your Bibles in that passage, which I'm now going to speak on. Let me pray for us. Our Father, we are so thankful that we have this moment together to read your words and that we have your spirit with us to help us to see and to grasp the glory of your son. And so we pray, please, might we grasp more of him and more of the great privilege it is uh, to be one of his people. We pray that we might have faith today and rest and rejoice and worship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever found yourself thinking, have I really made the right choice? It can be a fairly painful question to ponder, especially if the issue is serious. Perhaps you spent some money, bought a new car, holiday item of clothing, and you're thinking, oh, was it really worth the money? Perhaps you've left your job, started another. Did I do the right thing? Will I really be happier now? Perhaps it's a big life decision, a move, a marriage, a school for your child. Have I made the right choice? The more important these questions are, the more agonizing the concerns. But what about if you're a Christian here this morning? Do you ever find yourself wondering, have I really made the right choice about Jesus? Perhaps you look around and you see many people unconvinced by his claims. You see many people hostile to his concerns. You see friends, neighbors, family members utterly disinterested. And perhaps you feel some of the social pressure against you, the jokes, the put downs, the digs, the distance, and you wonder, have I really made the right choice? You may have heard last year about the conversion of the former Muslim and new atheist, Ayan Hirsi Ali. When the news of her becoming a Christian broke, her friend, the well-known atheist, Richard Dawkins, was utterly bemused. And he did all he could to publicly dissuade her from her newfound faith. He wrote an open letter scorning the reality of her choice. Uh, in it, he said, as you know, you are one of my absolutely favorite people, but seriously, I am you a Christian? And he, he then scorned a whole host of Christian beliefs. They believe in a divine father figure who Design the universe, listens to our prayers, is privy to our every thought. You surely don't believe that. Now, do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave three days after being placed there? Of course you don't. 
Someone of your intelligence does not believe you have an immortal soul which will survive the decay of your brain. Christians believe every baby is born in sin, saved from hell, only by the redemptive execution of Jesus. Do you believe anything close to that nasty scapegoat theory? Of course you don't. I am, I've always thought of you as one of the bravest people I know. How could you succumb to such weakness? And that's just one fairly mild example of the kind of pressure that many Christians feel. No wonder we find ourselves asking, have I really made the right choice? This morning we are continuing our series in 1 Peter, and this was exactly how it was for the Christians that he is writing to back then in the first century. There was social pressure against this scattered minority. Now, those around them heaped abuse on them for not conforming to the values of the age and for worshipping a different God, Jesus Christ, and him alone. And this letter then is written to help Christians to stand firm and to be faithful in a hostile world. Last week we thought about some of the horizontal implications of following Jesus, the call to love one another deeply from the heart. But in today's passage, Peter then considers the question of who exactly is the church, what is the nature of the Christian community, and why would you want to be a part of it when the world is against it? We're going to see three things. Here's the first. Those who come to Jesus, the living stone, are part of God's new temple. First of all, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter talks about what happens when someone becomes a Christian. He describes Jesus in verse 4 as the living stone. A living because although he was rejected and nailed to a cross, God raised him from the dead, the living stone. And Peter says when you come to him, uh, to Jesus, that's him in verse 4, verse 5, you also are like living stones built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If you're familiar with the Old Testament you'll know that all this imagery is the imagery of the temple now the house of God and God is being pictured here as a builder and we Christians are being pictured as the building project. The, the building project is a temple, a spiritual house with priests and sacrifices. But he's not talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. He's talking about a new spiritual temple made of people. And he says that is what Christians are part of. It's a fairly radical thought when you think about it. The physical temple in Jerusalem stood strong at the time, but Peter says that is not the real temple. It's just a visual aid pointing to the real temple. No, Peter says, you Christians scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, you are the real temple of God. Now, you may not feel significant or look it. Other people might say you're foolish, but you are the temple of God. You're the place where he dwells. It's a radical thought, but it's actually not novel because this is what Jesus taught. Do you remember what he said, John chapter 2? Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. And he was talking about his own body. He's the temple. Do you remember what he said about the physical temple in Matthew 24? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down, which is exactly what happened 10 years after Peter wrote. Because once the real temple had come, there was no need for the copy anymore. And Peter says it's actually what God promised he would do years and years before Jesus. He quotes the prophet Isaiah. For it, in scripture it says, this is verse 6, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So the prophet Isaiah had predicted that God was going to build a new temple in the new Jerusalem, Zion, and the first stone, the cornerstone, the foundation stone, will be a person, a him, the one you need to trust. This is also the image that's used in one of the Psalms, 
Psalm 118 that Jesus picks up on talking about himself in the last week before he died. He's in the temple talking to the religious leaders and he says, haven't you read the passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. So what Peter is saying here about these Christians being the temple of God is just what God promised and what Jesus said about himself. It's, it's radical, but it's not actually novel. God is building a new temple. And you, who come to Jesus, who believe in him, who put your hope in him, are a part of it. Those who come to Jesus, the living stone, become part of God's new temple. But what does that really mean? And what are the implications? Let me list three things. It means this. First, being a Christian is to belong to a people. Now, we thought last week about the culture of individualism that is everywhere around us that is the air that we breathe. So that we naturally think of me and God and not so much about us and God. Think about the songs that we sing. Rarely are they about us and God, mostly me and God. So much so that many Christians see church as an optional extra rather than a fundamental part of being Christian. So that people love to reel off these mantras. Oh, you don't need to go to church to be Christian. I can be a Christian just fine by myself. I have a relationship with Jesus. What more do I need? But in the world of the Bible, those are the strangest things that any Christian could ever say. It's a bit like a headless chicken running around a farmyard and saying, I'm still a chicken. I don't need my head to be a chicken. Which is kind of true, but also kind of absurd. Because to be severed from your body or your head is not a good thing. It's not how it's supposed to be. Because the Bible says when you come to Jesus, you automatically come to a family. The two things come together. You can't really have one without the other. It's like physical birth. You are physically born into a family. And so spiritually, we are also born into a family. Being a Christian is to belong to a people. Next, it means those who believe in Jesus belong. How do you get to be part of this people? Well, it's a very simple answer here. You have to believe in Jesus. You have to come to him. You have to trust in him. In the physical temple, it was the priests who would come near to God. And what they needed was to come with a sacrifice, an offering, because God is holy. We are sinners. You daren't come without a sacrifice. And yet the, the heart of the Bible story is that God has come himself to provide the ultimate sacrifice so that we, through faith, can be acceptable to God. In space, time and history, Jesus took on flesh to suffer in our place and to offer his own life, his blood on the cross as a perfect priest and perfect sacrifice. So that if we trust in him, we are joined to him. And the remarkable thing is he takes our sin and we receive his righteousness. We are cleansed from our sin. We are covered. We're loved by God. So that Peter can say, all of you now are priests. You have access to God. You can come and offer your lives as a sacrifice that are acceptable to God because he loves you, because he is for you. You see, God is not like a policeman jotting down in his notebook the things we've done wrong. No, he's a father who loves us because we're his children. He accepts us. He is for us. He delights in us. And those who believe in Jesus belong to God's people. If you're not a Christian here this morning, we are delighted that you're here it is such a joy to have people week by week who are just investigating the Christian faith. And one of the things that you'll notice if you do that is that it's not just information. It's a call to respond. Jesus calls you to come to him. And you need to do that. You cannot belong unless you believe. Showing up on a Sunday does not make you a Christian. Jesus says, come to me. And then you'll belong. It also means that those who belong will never be put to shame. I don't know if you feel 
ashamed at times to be a Christian. One of the most important moments um, of my youth was when I was about 14 years old. And as a typical 14-year-old, I was fairly terrified of being known as a Christian. I did all I could to stay quiet about it. It's pretty hard at primary school to escape um, because my dad would give assemblies as a local pastor, which was pretty embarrassing. But secondary school was a solace. For a while, I was unknown. And then the worst thing happened. My younger sister came to school, and not only did she come, she went to the Christian Union, and not only did she do that, she ganged up with my other sister and asked me why I wasn't going. Incredibly frustrated, frustrating to be exposed by your sisters. And so on one sunny afternoon at lunchtime, I remember walking the walk of shame from the playing field to the classroom where the Christian Union meeting was happening. My back was turned upon everyone I knew, my head bowed low, step by step by step. The shame of being known as a Christian. In case you're wondering, that was the best thing for me. But Peter says here that whatever the world says and thinks, in the end there will be no shame and none whatsoever. Because to be part of this people in the end, will not lead to shame. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. In the end, it will be the opposite. There will be honor, glory, vindication for those who trust in him. Because in the end, it will be seen that we stood against the world, which will perish. That we stood with his people, who will be vindicated. That we stood with Christ, the coming king. And so whatever the world says, there's no better choice than to associate with the people of God. Because those who belong will never be put to shame. So here's the, the first big truth this morning. Those who come to Jesus, the living stone, become part of God's new temple. Here's the second. Those who reject Jesus, the cornerstone, will in the end fall. Verse 7. Now, to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So here Peter contrasts the, the destiny of those who embrace Jesus, which is honor, and those who reject him, which is to fall. And it, it's very stark language. And we need to listen carefully to it. He gives a couple of illustrations from the Old Testament. The first is Psalm 118, where the image of the scrapyard is used. Uh, the, the builders are building a building, and they're looking for a foundation stone. They come across one particular one, but, but, they, but they don't want it. Looking at it, they say no, and they chuck it. But that turns out to be a pretty poor choice. In fact, a terrible choice. Because God is also building a building, and the very stone they chuck is the one that he then uses as his cornerstone. And when you translate that image, it becomes a fairly terrifying reality. Because what, he, what it means is, the one you crucified, Jesus, has become the centerpiece of human history. The judge of all mankind. The one before whom we will all stand. And you rejected him. It's terrifying. And then, quoting Isaiah, he uses another image. It's someone walking outside, perhaps on a dangerous mountain path. And there's a stone on the ground that's not seen, but then trips them up and they fall to great danger. What Peter is doing here is explaining that although God thinks of Jesus as precious, and although you Christians think of Jesus as precious, you have to understand the world will hate him and be deeply offended by him and stumble over him. Because the real Jesus, although he is wonderful, is inescapably divisive. And sinners who do not want to move away from their sin cannot tolerate him. And so, it's going to be like this. To some, he will be a stone of refuge, a safeguard from the coming storm, precious. But to others, a snare 
a stone which makes them fall, a rock of offence and stumbling. And that is exactly what we see today. Although all over the world people are turning to Jesus every day, many, certainly in our culture, cannot accept the real Jesus. People don't mind having him as one amongst many. Comparative religion is okay. People don't mind putting him on the list of the top 100 most influential people of all time, maybe one, two, or three, in the same category as everyone else. We're happy to acknowledge he existed and that he was a good man, but we cannot accept him as unique. That won't do. We cannot accept his authority. We make the rules, not him. We cannot accept that we need him because we don't need anyone. And so most people can only cope with a diluted Jesus, a therapeutic Jesus who makes you feel good. Jesus on our terms, not the real Jesus. But you know, that's nothing new. It's always been like this. The real Jesus offended the religious establishment of his day, and the real Jesus offends progressive society today because his claims are uncomfortably exclusive. He's the only one who can save. His diagnosis of the human condition is painfully accurate. We are lost in our sin, and his intolerance of human hypocrisy is uncomfortably confrontational because the issue is with all of us. We are all in danger of hypocrisy. And so what happens is the closer you get to Jesus, the more you actually listen to him, understand him, the more you will either love him because of his astounding mercy towards the undeserving, or frankly, you'll loathe him because he deeply offends your pride. And so with Jesus, you either rise or you fall. You either turn to him as your only hope or you stumble over him. And that's what we need to expect, that many people will stumble over him and we mustn't be surprised. Verse nine, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And so the reason that people won't accept Jesus is because of a heart of disobedience. They don't really want God, that's why. And yet at the very same time, Peter says, this is no surprise to God. As he puts it, it is what they were destined for. Which is to say, in God's mysterious providence, he chose before time to pass over them and to hand them over to their sin. That is mysterious. It is to tread on holy ground, but it is true. And so those who reject Jesus, the cornerstone, will in the end fall. And this for us today is both a comfort and a warning. It's a comfort, Christian. <laughs> you have not made a poor choice. Whatever the world says now, the only wise thing is to seek refuge in Jesus, the only one who can save us from the coming storm, the cornerstone of God's new building, the savior of our souls. There is no safer place to be. And yet clearly this is also a warning. And we may have the love of the world, and we may have the praise of humanity. You can get an OBE, an MBE, a glowing obituary. You can be an influencer, a celebrity, loved by society. But in the end, it will mean absolutely nothing. It's all vanity. Because if you reject the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the cornerstone, you are in the worst place you could possibly be. And I cannot really comprehend or articulate how important that is but in essence what you do with Jesus is what you do with God and it will determine your destiny because those who reject Jesus the cornerstone will in the end fall here's the third point but you have the great privilege of being God's chosen people saved to bring him praise in this last point Peter turns back to these Christians he describes the nature of the Christian community using the most glowing and exalted words. He says, verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received 
mercy. There's been a lot said in recent years over the problem of loneliness. It's often been described as its own pandemic. In the UK, it's been called the largest public health crisis that we face. A study in 2022 revealed that in the UK, 49% of people reported feeling lonely, occasionally, sometimes, or always. And just over 7% experienced chronic loneliness, meaning they felt lonely often or always. And so although we live in a culture of mass communication, mass connectivity, it is also one of profound loneliness. And although we talk about community all the time, that language seems to actually hide a painful reality, which is that people don't really belong to communities anymore. They don't really belong to families or friendships or neighborhoods. There may be people online who share our opinions, but an online community is something of an impossibility. Now, the reality is that most people are not known, not really loved, don't really belong, are deeply lonely, and are in need of community. And here is what God is doing. He is saving a people, not just a collection of individuals, but a people. And he says, you Christians, though you are scattered and far from home, exiles, strangers in the world, you are part of the people of God. And that is the greatest privilege imaginable. The words he uses are very familiar, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a treasured possession. Those are exactly the words used of Israel at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, and now applied to Christian believers. And so what was once true in part for Israel is now completely the case for the Christian. We are the people of God, God's multinational race through Jesus Christ. We are priests to the world. We're a nation set apart for God. We are his treasured possession. We're the people that God has saved from darkness. Darkness is where we were But now we have been called into his wonderful light. Uh, We are these people by the sheer mercy of God. God's mercy is his extraordinary love for undeserving sinners. That is, we don't deserve this privilege and we didn't seek it. We're not worthy of it. But God, when we were far from him, made us a people. When we'd not received mercy, he poured out his mercy on us. You see, Christianity is for the undeserving. It's for anyone willing to acknowledge their need, their sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins as an expression of God's abundant mercy. And you and I can experience that mercy today if we would call upon him. And notice what God's intention is. He says that you may declare the praises of him who brought you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so the church has been saved for worship, uh, to praise the greatness, the excellencies of God. Because what we come to see is that God is far, far better than we ever imagined he would ever be. He is worthy, uniquely worthy of all that we have. He is great, he is awesome, he is wonderful, he is glorious, he is perfect, he is excellent. And what that means is whatever our situations are, we always have reason to praise because of who God is and what he has has done. It is our duty and our deepest joy to praise him. And so, whatever the world says, there is no greater people to belong to no greater community, no greater identity. You have the great privilege of being God's chosen people saved to bring him praise. As we close, uh, what difference should this make? Let me list four things very, very briefly. The first, it should stop us in when we doubt. When we wonder, have I really made the right choice? Because we recognize the answer is, absolutely, I've made the right choice. There is no better choice. It should also cause us to praise. It is a wonderful thing to be brought out of ourselves and our little lives 
into something far bigger and far better. You see, when we gather on a Sunday morning, we are doing something incredibly significant. We are expressing what it means to be God's people. We are corporately, publicly declaring the praises of God. And that is a wonderful experience. It is also a glorious foretaste of our future, a glimpse of the world to come, and the very reason for our salvation, that we might know God and enjoy him and glorify him. This should also bind us to each other. As we saw last week, we have been saved to be this one another community together, the local church, an expression of God's universal church, a body, a fellowship, a covenanted community. It is a wonderful thing to belong to a local church. Our identity is not just I, it is we. And then finally, this should lift our spirits. Perhaps this morning you are particularly conscious of being downtrodden. Now perhaps you're feeling alone, are mistreated, abandoned, especially conscious of the cost of being a Christian. Well, this is what we see this morning. You could not be more blessed than you are. You could not be more treasured by God. You could not be more favored by him because you are part of God's people, loved, delighted in, saved from darkness, brought into his wonderful light. There's no safer place. There's no greater place because through Christ we are the chosen and treasured people of God, saved to bring him praise. Let me pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that you are the God of astounding mercy and that you are the God who has poured out your mercy on us through Jesus Christ. You have saved us from darkness and brought us into the light you have brought us to yourself and to your people. And Father, we pray that we might know Jesus and be found in him and belong to your people. Where we are not sure, cause us to call upon him. And where we doubt and we struggle, please refresh our minds and our spirits that we might rejoice and give you praise. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.